Hello everyone, Binary Apple here with episode or part 5 of Doctor Who series 13, Flux, Survivors of the Flux. Not that good of a title, but I can roll with it. Last episode was a great romp with 13 Claire and my new favourite character, Jericho, being hunted by angels who are after the angel, hiding in Claire's mind. Meanwhile, other distracting shit happened that detracted from the great story, and Thirteen was turned into an angel while our companions are stuck in 1901 on a great cliffhanger. So will today's episode be as good, or be a mess that people synonymise with chin balls? Thirteen is now trapped in this nothingness with the other angels, and is quickly released from her angel form. Wow, Thirteen really has a knack for escaping places quickly. First, she's sentenced to prison and spends not even ten minutes there. Now she is captured in an amazing cliffhanger and let go one minute and twenty-three seconds into the next episode. All thoughts like that aside, the angels start to berate and prod at Thirteen with her own voice, carrying on a great aspect of the angels, always speaking through other people. This scene is great and pretty intimidating. I would love to know what percentage of this is digital. Then, with a mention of her friends, we are brought to see our trio now in 1904's Mexico. They are after this potted relic. Yaz investigating, Dan almost dying, and doing well to give the scene a balanced comedic tone, while naturally progressing the story. Jericho is also as good as ever. With an increasing sense of tonal whiplash, we are brought back to 13, who is turned back to stone as she arrives to see an Ood, who gives her a badge that lets her stay in this new place. The Ood then takes Thirteen along to meet a She. Hmm, strange name. For this episode, the location and set work are fantastic. This room looks breathtaking for the time it's on screen. Thirteen now properly comes face to face with Orsok, who berates her and introduces the location as Division. Wow, now this is interesting. Let's see where it... Oh, no. Now we're back in 1904. For fuck's sake. The gang are in Constantinople, not Istanbul, having their relic deciphered. This relic is supposed to tell of the end of the world, that our friends will attempt to stop, as long as they are trapped here. We are told by Dan that it's been three years since they arrived in the last episode. Both Dan and Jericho have interesting things to say about their predicament in this episode. Yaz, on the other hand, is sad and hopeful. Her character this season summed up in two words, really. Some sketchy folks decide to lay some dynamite that Yaz puts cloth on. What quick thinking. Now boarding a boat, it seems they are being hunted by a gang. The partial date they found out was December 5th. I wonder if that has something to do with the final episode of Flux being released then. Hmm. Dan pretends to be a stowaway under the bed, and the room service beats Jericho and promptly dies for his transgression, taking a cyanide pill from his tooth. And apparently he has a snake tattoo on his arm, but uh, they don't mention that. If there's one thing I really have to downvote this episode for, it's that it's part 5 of 6 and still new elements are being introduced. These plot points may be interesting, but my word, if you're going to have the focus on this season be a continuous narrative in parts, I would appreciate either more episodes or some early rewrites to have plot points be introduced, at least in the first half of the season. To my knowledge, we don't even get a mention of unit, but here they are in this episode... The boys are worried about the body now in their room, and Yaz is quick to formulate the plan to dump the body overboard. A point Jericho picks up is a little morbid. Now, I know why people thought she might have betrayed Thirteen last season. She is instantly ready to cover up a death that took place right next to her. That she was one of the leading causes of. Makes you wonder what she did as a police officer. Now in 1958 England, Jesus, right here is where I draw the line. In episode 3, I was unfazed by the constant switching between times and point of view, because it was naturally part of the story and it had narrative links. 
Then last episode, every time we switched to Bell or to Yaz and Dan, to a lesser extent, it felt like we were being ripped out of a great story. But here, even the great parts of the story are cut up into monotonous confetti and shuffled one on top of each other like a deck of cards. What this episode brings is great, but I suffered such a whiplash from the constant jumping that now my spine has been crushed into dust. In this time zone, General Farquaad, I mean Farquaad, played by Robert Bathurst, also known as Padrak, a Time Lord villain from the Doom Coalition, meets with the Grand Serpent, who is just kind of in the 50s now. And these two join the newly started up unit. Wow, okay, I did not see that coming. These two have a pretty good chemistry on screen, even... If I did not like the Serpent in Once Upon Time, here he's actually intimidating and menacing as a villain. Not a crazy and angry bloke who decided to be evil. Yaz found a holographic device that 13 slipped into her pocket, apparently. 13 is kind of annoying, and so is Yaz as she broods. She tells Yaz to figure out the date that the aliens will attack, since the Flux is greatly diminishing dominion in the universe. And Dan and Jericho walk in from freshly dealing with the dead body. Jericho... I should have blute. A blute? I don't know what that means. And Dan does his best to reassure Yaz. Back with 13, she argues with Orsok, who deflects a lot of 13's questions. Honestly, I feel Jody's acting and some of the writing here is pretty good in these scenes with Orsok. Far better than the rest of this season in my memory. Orsok is now the de facto leader of the Division. She explains the group, a select number of Time Lords and operatives, that molded and intervened in the universe's affairs to fit their grand design. Wow, even in the new series, the Time Lords cannot stick to their no interference policy. Paired with Jodie's bump in acting, Barbara Flynn does a great job as Orsok here. She felt a little flat in Once Upon Time, but somehow here... She feels like a far more rounded out character when expressing exposition rather than giving more questions. Thirteen searched the whole universe for the Division and wonders why she couldn't find it. And that is because they aren't in the universe. They are between our reality and the neighbouring one. Orsok's ship is currently stationed in the void. Shown with this lovely shot. In 2021 Earth, Lupari's ship drifts from the shield, unhailable, leaving the Earth vulnerable. So to fix the shield, Carvanista forcibly takes Bell's ship over and brings it to Earth. We also get a good look at this great design of a space station, I guess. Planetoid, maybe? Uh... Presumably on said planetoid slash space station, Vinda apparates and finds the groups of hostages captured by Swarm and Azure. Vinda sneaks away as Swarm kills the hostages to power the Time Force, to presumably connect the Doctor and the Ravagers again. Orsok attempts to display the scale of the design, the Division's new plan. Conversion allows beings to be stable in the Void. As the original universe is destroyed, the Division ship will take its genetic samples from the universe, or Universe 1, into the next to preserve what the Flux will destroy. Orsok states that they plan to do this, since because of what the Doctor does and represents, she has ruined the Universe 1 and taken away the Division's ability for total control. They debate morality, and Orsok exposits that she created the Flux to get rid of her enemies, Universe 1, and the Doctor. The Doctor asks what everyone else is thinking. Who even are you? And it's revealed Orsok is Tech Tayun's latest regeneration. The one who found the Timeless Child. Back in the 1960s, we're brought to the original Unit HQ. The General and Serpent talk about how Unit is going with a great cameo by the Brig and a reference that I think is to the War Machines. Hold on, those stairs look familiar. I swear to God, if this is Ashen Hill Manor, I'm going to scream. We are shown that Unit picked up the TARDIS from the village, and after finding out the servant is not human, he promptly kills the general in an impactful scene. The servant that has been present on his clothing since episode 3 is actually some sort of psychic creature. Look at that wood panelling. Definitely Ashen Hill Manor. 
The Ood gives us an update on the flux and the progress of the division to the next universe as the Doctor rambles. Tectaean states the Doctor is here so that the universe can be destroyed with no interference, as is the Doctor's brand. And she asks whether or not the Master was telling the truth. Tectaean confirms his statements and Thirteen gets a fantastic spiel, questioning her past and lashing out. I complained earlier in another video that often when Thirteen gets angry she comes off childlike. But here Jodie is so close to giving the standard performance I expect from her after seeing Broadchurch. Tectaean states some of the Doctor's hypocrisy and reveals that she was the one who had the Doctor's memories erased. And she leaves Thirteen to be guarded by the Ood. Back on planet Hand, Vinda is easily captured and placed in a passenger by Swarm. We get a look inside Passenger, and even if it's not much, I like the empty and grand feeling it gives off. Vinder introduces himself to the newly found Diane, and with a badass line, they plan their escape. Now thrust to Nepal, Jericho and the other two seek a shaman of sorts, who is goddamn hilarious. Somehow he balances his comic relief with the pace of the scene, meaning unlike a lot of strange comic characters from Tribunal's Run, looking at you, hyphen, pregnant ginge and rhyme, he is a welcome addition that you don't want immediately thrown out of the scene. Although this episode does do a good job of just dropping things and moving to the next scene, the shaman delivers his three words of wisdom. Fetch your dog. Leading to the gang Indiana Jonesing to China and writing a message for Carvin Easter by the wall. Ready for pickup. Man, do these two grow beards quickly. Carvinista gets the message, but is turns out he has no time travel, so the message seems pretty useless now, doesn't it? Thirteen persuades the Ood to do the little of putting up the universal display for her. Thirteen gets the brilliant plan to just reverse the flux, as currently the erasure is centering on Earth. She starts getting whispers and chatter in her head while trying to plan. She gets visions of the house from episode 2 and is called towards a golden fob watch. An amazing level up of the chameleon arch fob watch's design from series 3. Now in the 80s, the serpent asks this Slovene looking ass to be the chair of unit. And funnily enough, he tells the serpent to go and do naughty things to himself. In... Another reused location, this time from The Vampires of Venice. Am I the only one seeing this? The serpent follows him home and kills him, telling us that the flux caused him to lose his assets and people. Now back on the same boat as before, the gang are greeted by Joseph Williamson, who promptly disappears as soon as we see him. Very on brand, as Dan gets to flex his local Liverpool knowledge. Now seeking Williamson out. Current day Williamson is apparently dead, but still walks the tunnels. They use twine to path their way and find Williamson, who is glad for the assistance in the task of fixing or at least making a safe haven against the time tragedy happening. And Dan gets a funny interaction with Yaz. Well, at least she isn't just depressed anymore. Thirteen yells at Tecte in a while and she states that she has caught the rogue angel. Much like the angel, she offers Thirteen a deal. The Fob Watch to stay with her, or leave and save Universe 1. This other universe is apparently the other side of the timeless wormhole. But Thirteen dismisses the deal until Tectaean offers to leave the Earth intact, leaving Thirteen speechless. Now, in 2017, Kate Stewart, yes, meets with the Serpent, who wants to shut down the unit operation, explaining that horrible joke in resolution which unfortunately wasn't the only horrible joke in that episode Kate fights back with an amazing monologue wow I am so happy to see her back honestly I know it's asking a bit much but I wish we could have seen some other unit members here but I can do with Kate now I love Kate's inclusion here and she will probably be as good in the next episode but only appearing after the 40 minute mark, I do wish that she would have been absent from the last trailer. Even if her appearance was exciting, it's not a good feeling to wait 40 minutes for it. 
And I know some people don't watch the next time trailers for exactly this reason, especially after John Sims Masters reveal, but come on. If I didn't, I would have gone onto Twitter the next day and all I would have seen was Kate, 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 and I would be utterly dumbfounded and it would still have been ruined. So, and there's not much she could do about it. Kate returns home only for a keyhole bomb to go off in her face, leading to her going undercover after giving a nod to Osgood, letting the serpent do what he likes. Back in the present, Belle's ship is added to the shield and Carvinista jumps on board her ship to fuck her shit up but they are interrupted by an attack from outside. Back in 1904, we are finally given a payoff to Williamson. Five episodes out of six. Five episodes out of six. His tunnels hold portal doors to many times and places. I love this idea. Some gateways have changed, allowing him to appear in the previous episodes. He seeks to use them to save people, but they are also attacked from multiple doors. Bell and Carvinist panic, as the Serpent makes a deal with the Sontarans, having his tattooed minion, aim all weaponry back in on Earth. The Sontaran ships come for revenge, and battle with the Lupari, invading the ships as well as Williamson's doors, however they manage to do that. Our cliffhanger is given as 13 challenges Tektiun, but she is crashed by Swarm and Azure, who were using the connection established in the Halloween Apocalypse to get to Division. He evils around for a bit and promptly murders Tectaeum to 13's shock and pain. Azure descends on the watch and Swarm turns to attack 13 next. Wow, another great cliffhanger on all fronts. Now, don't get me wrong. I really like what this episode contained and the answers it gave us. But for the love of God, all these strands are presented in such a messy way to evenly set up the finale allowing us a great cliffhanger that we uh, constantly jump from point to point so fast I almost felt sick. In layman's terms, the content was mostly positive, but the execution and presentation were horribly intrusive. I give Doctor Who Series 13, Flux Episode, or Chapter 5, Survivors of the Flux, a begrudging and regrettable 6.5 out of 10. But if it was structured a different way with the same result of content quality, I would have no qualms giving it an even 8 out of 10 like the previous episode. Thank you everybody for watching this review of Doctor Who Flux. Next week we'll be doing the final episode until New Year's. Please like the video if you liked it. Comment down below if you wish and subscribe to the channel. And if you do ring the notification bell so you're told about whatever I'm reviewing after Doctor Who Flux. Once again thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages with writing on the side.